Welcome to To The Point. The focus in Lansing in the next two months will be very much on the state budget with billions of dollars to spend and no lack of suggestions on how to spend it. Lawmakers will have to find a plan that can be something that the House, the Senate, and the Governor can all sign off on. Most challenging part will be coming up with something that the Republican-dominated legislature and the Democratic Governor can agree to in an election year that has everybody at the state level up for re-election. Ottawa County Senator Roger Victory talked to us about the challenges that lie ahead. Senator, we're at an interesting time. Every 10 years, there are new districts mm -hmm. drawn, and you and all of your colleagues have somewhat different districts in which to run. Filing deadlines just finished. There'll come a place in a time we'll talk about elections. That's not what we're mm -hmm. here to talk about today. I only bring it up because what we are working on right now, what you are working mm -hmm. on right now, uh, our but the budget process, but it's not done in a vacuum. So everybody knows that there's an election coming up. So tell me where you are, kind of in the early steps of the budget right now. Yes, we are in the early uh, part of the budget. Uh, I do chair two subcommittees. I do the general government for all the departments, well, a good part of the departments here in Lansing, like the Secretary of State's office and uh, the Department of Treasury and those, and also the MDAR budget. So uh, actually, uh, today we'll be uh, we'll be releasing some of the uh, general budget, uh, general government budgets, and then tomorrow we'll be doing the MDAR budgets. And this is the first step of the process, and just, uh, then from there we'll be going to other negotiations and this and engaging other stakeholders too. So, for people who aren't really familiar, this is the beginning of that overall negotiation. The Senate negotiates mm -hmm. with the House. Yep. The Senate and the House negotiate with the Governor. Republicans and Democrats negotiate with each other and getting this done. So even though this will move along pretty rapidly, I would guess, between now and the first part of July, last part of June, um, there there's still a lot of steps to be taken. And one of the, the things that, and it seems maybe against type, but may complicate the process, is there's a whole lot of money in the Treasury. And when there's a whole lot of money in the Treasury, while it seems as though it would be much easier to put together a budget, there still remains a lot of pressure on where that money is to be spent. Very true statement. For every dollar, there's a hundred ask. And for the, each hundred of those requests, uh, the, some are good proposals, some are well, a little bit out there on the component. But they, you know, we have to vet through that. And then, of course, uh, um, the House may see it from a different perspective. The administration is going to see it from the other perspective. They are members across the aisle are going to see it from another perspective. So as a chair of the, each of those subcommittees, you have to wade through those waters and make sure that at the end of the day that we're providing a good product to operate the government for the state of Michigan, but also be uh, conscientious of the hardworking men and women, the taxpayers of the state of Michigan too because these are their dollars and we got to be responsible for those dollars and also making sure that we don't set ourselves up for a, a non-sustainable programs because a lot of these need to be focused at one-time potential expenditures one-time investments and focus on that because we, uh, you know, we, we're term limited here in Lansing and with those term limits there's gonna be other people coming in and we gotta make sure we lay that foundation for them in the future too. So you, you have the short-term needs and also long-term needs. And when we have these opportunities, some additional dollars, how do we make Michigan a better place in the next decade? And you've already uh, allocated a, a bunch of the federal funds that have come in, but there's still more, maybe a couple billion dollars. Is that a correct? Part? And there's and there's a couple of buckets that we work with. You have the general fund dollars; those are the dollars generate the state. They're more flexible, and of course, everybody wants to get their hands on those. And, uh, and then there's these federal dollars: is ARPA dollars and the IJA dollars. There's just two. Uh, uh, funding mechanisms and each of those funding mechanisms has unique characteristics so in order to use those dollars there are certain prescriptive measures that are in place so uh, there may be some aspects for some investment into uh, certain infrastructure that certain dollars would be made more available or not made available so that puts some complexity to the process too so as people say well there's all this money out there well some is usable in certain areas and some is not and then there again we have to be conscientious of the hard-working taxpayers and how have we better to utilize those dollars uh, on their behalf. Well, like most federal dollars, they have, all have some strings attached. And we should point out that the federal dollars that you're talking about have come as um, most of them th from COVID relief that Correct. came out of the federal government. But when we talk about the regular budget, that will be done in supplemental appropriations. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about the budget you're working on right now, uh, particularly when it comes to health and human services, there are a whole lot of federal dollars that backfill that as well. And those two 
uh, have to go only to a certain place. That is correct. So if you look at the general budget, uh, there's the restricted dollars, which is like two thirds of the budget and less than one third is those general fund dollars. And a lot of people don't realize how limited those general fund dollars, especially when corrections takes up a good portion of it. Because uh, that department of corrections is done with basically state dollars. And that has been always about a billion dollar expenditure right there. And so uh, I bring that all up to say that uh, some of the budget is going to be done before you start because those they're federal correct. dollars are exactly. going to go where they're going to go. They're, they're already assigned, they're, we call it pass-through dollars. Mm -hmm. So you're starting now, you're even as we speak, you're going to start putting out some of these, mm -hmm. uh, I think you said earlier, like statement budgets. They're kind of like, this is where we are. That's a good way to describe it. You yeah. know, so, mm -hmm. so you'll give them your cards and they'll show you their cards yes. and then you, you start from there. There, going back to my original statement about the uh, elections, there will be a desire on the part of a number of members to get out of Lansing and back into the district mm -hmm. so they can knock on doors and talk to folks and do those events throughout the summer leading up to the August primary. And there is a statute that suggests the legislature should have the budget to the governor by July 1st. That hasn't happened yet mm -hmm. since that statute passed, but there have been some kind of extenuating circumstances with COVID and all of the other things going on. Is this the year that you get the budget uh, over to the governor by July 1st? There is a strong incentive to make that happen because just as you described, we're in that process. We have new districts. There's a lot of uh, the campaigning, that component going on, or, or constituent relations, we can refer to as that. So there's a uh, desire to get out there, listen to the people, get the pulse what's going on, uh, and get this budget process wrapped up. And But with these dollars, especially, uh, uh, with the other supplementals that could confuse it, it's about it's our intent and get this, do the work, get it done, and uh, put dot the I's and cross the T's. I don't want you to weigh in somewhere where you're not comfortable, but I ask everybody more or less the same question, and that is, where are we in terms of managing Michigan government? We've seen two years mm -hmm. where the legislature and the governor have had some really big disagreements. We've seen, we know that uh, the people in the state have been under a lot of pressure because of the pandemic. And we know there have been big differences of opinion between many Republicans and this Democratic governor about how she handled mm -hmm. um, the response to COVID-19. But as we said here on a relatively sunny day with uh, the numbers, at least for today, in relatively good shape, uh, with the state's finances in much better shape mm -hmm. than anybody would have ever imagined, or certainly than I would imagine coming out of a pandemic and the kind of business interruptions that we had. Are things a little smoother in Lansing than they have been over the past two years? There ha it is smoother, but as I, we come into the new era of post-COVID, uh, our constituents, uh, the hardworking men and women in the state of Michigan are expecting these basic services be uh, performed. And my frustration is, uh, is we come in making, like the ego and those departments, making sure they get those works, those permits out to those business communities. Because we have a lot of expansion, we have, you see that construction, but for that construction to occur, permits have to be granted. And it just seems to be a slow process that's uncalled for. Uh, Secretary of State, making sure that when people go and need those registrations done, those basic services, there, there's personnel there that can get those appointment times, hold those uh, areas accountable. Uh, and it goes on through the whole p facets of things, making sure that government is working and those who are to be f providing the service are there and get, I believe too, we need to have in these these offices open. We're we're in Lansing, and it's just shocking that we we need to have these people here, uh, not virtually, but in presence, doing the job. Well, and that goes back to the general government budget. I mean, you hold the purse strings mm -hmm. as the legislature, and you've been here on both ends, the House and in the Senate. Uh, is there anything you can do, if those are some of your priorities, to emphasize that to the different departments and suggest? that you would like to see these things done in the process of putting together their budget. And that's that we use the term boilerplate. So we fund the fund these programs or fund the government, but there's also that prescriptiveness in the language and a language can dictate uh, what we expect. And that those are something which I expect to see is more presence and making sure that these departments are doing the job that they need to be doing. That way business can be done and also uh, any of the services such as getting your license done in the proper time and the whole 
list of things can go on. Basic government can be operating, meeting the needs of the, each of all the people in the state of Michigan. Finally, moving away from the budget, but before we do, we talked about uh, the fact that there's a lot of money, and I'm not talking about federal money, I'm talking about there's a lot of money uh, that came through the state coffers, and at one time it looked like there was going to be maybe a $3 billion deficit, and now maybe there's that much, I hate to call it excess, but extra. It was quite a roller coaster, right? Yeah, it sure was. So when you sit down and look at those numbers, those are big numbers. Mm -hmm. How do you plan for the future? Because we certainly have seen times when there have been spending protocols that, that go along, which is fine as long as the revenues stay up. But we've also seen boom and bust periods mm -hmm. in the state of Michigan. In the mid-2000s, we saw uh, that big recession that hit Michigan first and perhaps harder than a lot of places. Um, so when you spend those dollars that you've got in the bank today, how concerned are you that they're going to be there four years down the road or eight years down the road? Well, the most critical point is we, we cannot do not start ongoing programs because if the, do, the dollars may be there today, but as we see the cyclical economy of the state of Michigan, uh, those dollars most likely won't be there six years from now or eight years from now. And there's are those opportunities that we can meet. Uh, you know, a lot of our communities have a lot of unfunded liabilities, OPED payments and that, and uh, some of these dollars could be eligible to get that get those payments down because and then they can get their uh, house in order, lower those costs and then they can provide more services or just uh, that way they don't have to raise taxes or those millages and then that way they can refer more of those dollars for repairing the roads. So basically here's an opportunity we have to get a lot of our municipalities and our communities in the state of Michigan on a much better financial footing, get their balance sheets lined up and then we do that, then those expenditures don't have to do those uh, post payment to clean up that debt, but they can actually go repair those roads and address those needs in the community, hire additional police officers if needed, or fire protection. Uh, that's a key opportunity I think we have in front of us right now too. But there's more than just the budget on the Senator's mind. When we come back, he'll talk to us about what he sees as economic opportunity in Michigan that might require the state to get out of the way or be a partner. Welcome back to To The Point. Senator Roger Victory is a lifelong farmer from Ottawa County who sees tremendous potential for expansion of that part of our economy, even as we all pay more for food at the grocery store. Here's what the senator says could be an added value for agriculture. Senator, before we started recording, we were having a conversation about how Michigan's economy has a lot of opportunity out mm -hmm. there. And some of that surrounds something that you know a lot about, and that's agriculture. Obviously, we've talked about it before. Um, you're, you're still running your farm in Ottawa County, and as spring comes by, you're doing some, some planting even as we speak. But just raising a crop is not all there is to agriculture. And you were talking about what you see uh, and I hope I'm stating this correctly, as both a need and an opportunity um, to try to help maybe backfill with some processing and some mm -hmm. of the value-added things that we could do here in the state. Yeah, some lessons learned from COVID. I have a number of constituents, people throughout the state of Michigan, saw empty uh, store shelves. They, poultry wasn't on the store shelf, meat wasn't on the sh store shelf, but they saw barns full of chickens. They saw barns full of turkeys. They saw this livestock out there. And they started asking questions. And Michigan is a unique state because we grow it, but we also process it. And we have the blue economy. We have potential growth, but there's been the consolidation and it's uh, an over-regulation in some areas, and we lost all those processors. So a lot of these uh, protein processors, we refer to them, uh, have left the state and yet uh, so that it has to be, the livestock has to be trucked many miles out of state and then has to be trucked in another form. And we have opportunity, I think we can bring these back to our hometown communities, uh, have that uh, connectivity to the food aspect so you, if you know the farmer, get that um, that beef for a pork process. And But there's a lot of restrictions and a lot of those restrictions is infrastructure because when you process this, it puts a big strain on the sewer or water treatment systems and uh, one aspect we had an opportunity uh, just in Ottawa County to do about a 900 million dollar expansion to a dairy processing facility let me repeat that 900 million dollars we talk about new uh, 
manufacturing facilities at that level, everybody gets the attention. And that went to the state of Texas because of the situation with some water availability issues and treatment issues. Well, we got to prevent that from happening in the future. And so a lot of these facilities are going to be in our smaller communities, and it just overwhelms the capacity of their uh, to build those aspects. So we can come along as willing partners at the state level and line that up, retain that uh, Expand and retain those uh, facilities, and that's jobs there in those communities. And the indirect effect is also a ro more robust agricultural community. And you know what the real beautiful thing is? We can reduce those inflationary food costs at the checkout counter at your local grocery store because when it can be more locally produced, and then you shorten those logistic channels up, that means lower food costs too for the hardworking men and women in the state of Michigan. Let's talk a little bit about the near term and the long term when it comes to trying to reinvest in and, and reestablish uh, processing plant, particularly mm -hmm. for, as you call it, the protein uh, processing. It, it seems like that would be kind of a, a longer term scale up. That, that wouldn't happen overnight, right? No, it, it doesn't happen overnight, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity, even in Western Michigan. Uh, we have a uh, area up in the, the Coopersville area, uh, which is taxing the water treatment system. But yet in the Muskegon community, we have a state-of-the-art water treatment plant that's underutilized because of the closure of the paper mills. So if we can utilize that undercapacity in the Muskegon uh, community and then develop those processing facilities in the Coopersville and even, let's say, develop a corridor, if we would be able to do a, like a water tr pipeline there and the others can uh, join on in there, you s just think of what the possibilities can happen there. And just in that Coopersville area alone, I mean, well over a billion dollars has been invested in those processors as we speak. And there's more demand for their product, uh, and they want, they need to expand. But the biggest restriction is they have met the capacity for that treatment of their uh, waste product. We've had this conversation before too, but I think it's worth revisiting. There was a time when we were a very agrarian society, and you know, everybody had some contact with a farm in some way shape or form but now in this legislature i would say that's a relatively small percentage of people who are actively involved in any type of agribusiness how tough does that make it when you start talking with your colleagues about some of these things if they're not um, if they're not totally familiar with them? well you almost start to see my smile come across my face because one thing about uh agricultural issues and availability of food and those type of things it does uh everyone's interested because we all need to eat and there's that common bond of that uh, that connectivity so uh it can it crosses the political aisle on those aspects and uh, it's just uh it's a pleasure to come to Lansing and be an advocate for the agriculture community. It's a pleasure to come to Lansing to advocate that, you know, how can we provide a healthy nutritional diet to the, you know, the state of Michigan, and also if we can expand that, be a provider throughout the nation and the world. The opportunities here, you know, I've mentioned about the blue water economy, and what's exciting when you can see other colleagues learn that or listen to that component and that when that seeds planted and see that grow and that sprout and then let's take on those initiatives and uh, I, there again that's about the diversity of the economy of the state of Michigan and the potential is pretty much un, uh, unlimited here because we do have water availability unlike other parts of the world and the parts of the country. When you uh, talked earlier about some of the pressures, some of the inflationary pressures that we've seen on food, and we know that some of that is because of processing, some of it may be because of supply chain, some of it may be lack of uh, truck drivers, you know, we've seen a, a number of, of different aspects. Now you add on to that, one of the largest grain producing regions in the world, the Ukraine, uh, under attack from Russia, they say maybe as much as 20% uh, of their crop will not be harvested because of all of the problems going on there. Uh, how much does that concern you, knowing uh, about you know the way we process uh, grains in this country and how we use them? Very concerned. Uh, one interesting fact I uh, learned was that 13% of the world calories, think of that, 13% of the world calories are produced from that region. So those calories of consumption that may be in form of uh, wheat, corn, other protein products has to be replaced. And, but you know, we realize that there's a limited production capacity throughout the world because there are only certain areas we can produce that food. So you're going to see some geopolitical turmoils go along. You see the conflict right now with the war in Ukraine and Russia. But there's other areas of the country, especially in northern Africa, where this could start to affect. Then you've got the inflationary food at your local checkout counter here in, uh, in the United States and Michigan. 
and all those factors that go along with it because you know we see the high price of gas which I'm very concerned working on behalf of too but yet uh, you have to eat you can sometimes drive a little less uh, you know you have to drive up back to work but you, you have to have a, you know you, you can I, sometimes we all can eat a little less too but at a certain point you just have to consume and uh, food and that is going to be an issue and I don't see that going away here in the near future and that's where I, I, that's why I continue to be a strong advocate for what we can do here in the state of Michigan to uh, be a play in the international market and national market. Well you brought up gas prices I think about diesel and I think about agriculture and you see uh, those prices have really mm -hmm. been shooting up uh, all of that ultimately gets passed along to the consumer so I mean even as we speak, those of inflationary costs are going to be baked into this year's crop mm -hmm. when it's sold, right? Yeah, but there's some, uh, some of these costs can't be passed on by the farmer, so there, there is a commodity you're producing. Fortunately, at this point in time, you do see the uh, prices increasing for the farmer as a commodity, but then you also have the dairy industry, the poultry industry. They have to buy that additional high-priced corn, and thus sometimes they can't pass along, so there can be a big squeeze on the farmers. Also, we're talking about diesel fuel prices with fertilizer prices to the rough, but where does a lot of potash fertilizer come from? the Ukraine area and Russia. So that issue is no longer exporting out. So you see uh, doubling the price of a potash. And urea is another component into the fertilizer mix, and that's to rely on natural gas to be produced. And we know what's happening in natural gas supplies. So you can see it's coming from so many different areas. So the farmers are receiving higher prices for commodities, but it's barely keeping up with their input costs. So you expressed uh, in the first part of the show some optimism about getting a budget done. We've talked about some of the inflationary uh, pressures that are impacting um, obviously everybody in the state, but it also impacts state government. And so do you, do you try to kind of counter that with this budget? Do you try to put money in some areas where you think the inflationary costs are, are going to hit harder? For example, probably not the top of mind thing, but state police, for example, are mm -hmm. going to be shelling out a lot more money for road patrols, yep. as well county sheriffs and all law, en law enforcement. Is that something you uh, you try to account for as you put together the numbers? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, one of the aspects is the judiciary chair and uh, public safety chair uh, seeing the, the need for investment into our law enforcement and the investment at the state level and even in our community level. And uh, we have had a number of different uh, committee hearings on that and a number of different bills. And that's one area. And even the uh, police training and MCOLs uh, area, uh, that area has not been funded. It has not kept up with inflation. And this is where, uh, as we deal with policy, there's also the funding, the appropriation side to the story. So as we are dealing with some of the policy of how to, uh, you know, for police improvement, uh, make sure we do that investment with the money along with the investment with the policy. As for that budget that we discussed, the idea is to have it ready for the governor to sign or veto by July 1st. That's the beginning of the new fiscal year for school districts, for example, that depend heavily on knowing what Lansing is going to allocate in order to gear up for classes in the fall. The new deadline was put into a statute after the first disastrous budget process after Governor Whitmer took office when she and the legislature could not agree on anything. Since that law has been on the books, the budgets have not been done by the deadline, at least partially because of complications from the pandemic. So. Will this be the first year that all the sides hit the deadline? There appears to be a big incentive to do so, and we'll be watching closely. We're back with a final thought next.